If I can't keep my head held high enough, I'll just speak love and watch the smiles come. Bring my spirits up. There's some shit I like to fix, but I still know that I'm blessed. guys we're back we're approaching Ruben's house on White Court which according to all the proceedings in court as of late is where Kristen was buried for a time and then dug up and we're gonna do something today we'll give you a little look of kind of how spread out this neighborhood is it's not just a regular neighborhood and we're gonna be doing something here that I've always wanted to do Bobby's just gonna drive in and uh, do a circle out. I always get, I always get really nervous coming through here. <laughs> um, he's usually outside or something, or someone is, and I don't know why, but it always freaks me out. <laughs> so we'll see. And then once we do that, I'll explain. I'll explain more about. Okay, so we're leaving this. The White Court House address. And we're gonna drive straight out to the Wozna area. We've been wanting to do this from this spot. You can see how pretty the mountains are there. Because this would have been the exact route they would have taken this night that they're accused of digging her up and relocating her remains. And I do have notes that I'll be reading throughout that ties all this in. So we wanted to start there. I'm gonna attach you guys to the windshield here in a minute so you can actually get the point of view as if you're driving out there and then later I'll pick it up. Okay. This should work, it worked. My other vehicle last time. I just don't want you flipping around up to the sunshine. All right, so here we go, headed out to Wasna. Where it's believed Kristen remains are still spread out to this day and you'll, you'll, you'll see as we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and start covering the notes. And we'll start off with it's official. Just like we expected, the defense attorney Sanger officially filed change of venue motion on Wednesday, March 9th, 2022 in San Luis Obispo County Court. And uh, there's a hearing coming up on the 16th that I'll be attending online, of course, not in person. They're not allowing it at this point. And I was hoping we might hear more about it. So we're going to take you out to West. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah, I was wondering if they were going to talk more about the change of venue motion on the 16th, but they're not. And I have the other date I made in the notes here coming up. It's so hot in here. Okay. Sorry, guys. So whatever does happening on the at the hearing on the 16th, I'll be sure to update you guys. And I do have some notes as far as what was uh, put in the motion for the change of venue. The defense feels that they can't get a fair trial in Slow County. The motion points to the following reasons. The media coverage, her likeness is prominent in the local community with billboards, memorials, podcasts. They're claiming Paul. What was that chiming sound? Mm -hmm. Because there's so much going on right now. I just, 
Okay. They're claiming Paul has been disparaged and demonized and portrayed as the only suspect. Uh, the motion also refers to the small population in San Luis Obispo County compared to other counties and the gravity of Paul's murder charges. The motion also states the attitude of the community and how it's been vicious and relentless. This includes the press, private individuals, podcasters, bloggers, website managers, and the public. Also the Sheriff's Department, the DA's office, and their public relation efforts to spread their narrative. So March 30th will be the hearing regarding the change of venue, and I'll try to attend that virtually as well, and I'll update you guys what happens. The trial is still set to start April 25th, 2022, and that six, March 16th hearing is a status hearing where they just check in and they see if there's anything else anyone needs to discuss or schedule or whatever. So me personally, I'm really proud of our community and all those things that the defense put in that motion. It's true because we're not going to forget Kristen and we're going to demand justice for her and her family. And the evidence should be strong enough whether the trial is held here or wherever it ends up. Because they're probably going to grant the venue, change of motion venue, I think. That's what I'm expecting, in my opinion. And the evidence should be strong enough. And we are going to keep fighting for justice. So, by the way, what the Wasna area we're headed to is about 20 minutes out of town, is how it's described. It's an old historic town site out there. All right, now that I gave you the update about the change of venue, I'm gonna cover some of the connections to Wasna and so forth. I hope the wind isn't too much for you. I hope you guys are hearing me good. Okay. So this isn't the first time we've driven out to Wasna. In 2020, when they announced that they thought this is where she was taken, we came back out here again. We actually almost moved out here at one time. You'll see that house when we get way out to the town site. So that day that we came and drove out here, we were pretty, it was very discouraging. You'll see how overgrown it is and, and just the wildlife and just such rugged terrain. Houses spread out. And That's how we like it. <laughs> That's how we like it. Yeah, we, love, we would love to live out here. But as far as finding someone's remains. No. Yeah, it's, it's, you'll see. You'll it's see. tough. Okay, so let's head on to the rest of the information I have noted here. By the way, it wasn't just 2020 when it was mentioned she was possibly buried here. It's been rumored and talked about for quite some time that she's probably actually scattered out here. So on April 22nd, 2021, news coverage covered that James Murphy, the civil attorney for the Smart family, filed suit and included a claim that Kristen was removed from under Reuben's deck at 710 White Court in AG and scattered in the Wasna area. On July 28, 2021, news coverage stated in a 2004 authoritative authorities, excuse me, authorities received a trip that Chris, a tip. Very windy. They received a tip that Krista was buried in the Wasna area, and witness Jennifer Hudson claimed that Paul had admitted he buried her under a skate ramp in Wasna area. And they did search out here and near the supposed skate ramp and nothing was found there. Paul allegedly made this statement in 1996. She claimed he made a statement I prefer not to include here. And Jennifer the witness didn't tell law enforcement about any of this until 2019. 
other skateboarders present St. Paul was never even at that location. San Luis Obispo is where this all, uh, in the, sorry, never mind that. It's kind of windy. This is hard to read and be on this road. I don't know if I can do this. I'll, I'll, I'll keep trying, guys. It's hot and windy and just, Jennifer's boyfriend also denied ever seeing Paul and Wasna or anywhere else. And Jennifer did actually testify on day eight of the preliminary trial. And I personally don't want to call anyone a liar, but I have my doubts about what she said. And it's unfortunate if people are going to come forward with improper statements. Because it could hurt the case, really. Hopefully all the forensic evidence that I've heard about is what's going to carry the case. I even wonder if she should testify at the actual trial, but the lawyers know what they're doing. So the week of July 28, 2021, investigators searched Wozna for Kristen for the podcast, Your Own Backyard. I highly recommend that podcast if you haven't already listened to it. In that podcast, they cover how in 1999, a suspicious shoe was found in the rural Wasna area, not far from where police also searched back in 1996. So as I said before, Wozna has been part of the case pretty close to the very beginning. We just need to keep praying for justice too as this court date approaches for April. You can see how pretty it is out here too, all the orchards and there's horses out here. It's actually really pretty. Okay. So that's the Wasna stuff. Now um, I'm gonna do a trigger alert here. Trigger alert, trigger alert. This section's basically called Paul Chester, his nickname Chester. You know what that means. So we're gonna cover some of the disgusting thing that he's been accused of over the years and I got some of this from the LA Times uh, court proceedings podcast and other articles another article from 2016 as well so give me a minute here I'm gonna get car sick so this is gonna be about SA it's a word they don't like said on YouTube it's not going to be very graphic, but it is going to describe what four women have claimed regarding Paul. And there's many more women. This is the, is the account of four of them. Actually, listen to the podcast to the last episode he did. It goes into more recent Los Angeles victims where women explain their experience with Paul. So these four women claim that he sexually assaulted them. The court mentioned even more women. This is only the four brave enough to speak out and tell their story. There's definitely similarities in the different accounts that they share. This goes all the way back to his teen years at Royal Grande High School, which I've done an episode showing you the high school and such. The podcast includes many creepy accounts from high school where he was called Creepy and then later in college they nicknamed him Chester. So those are not endearing names. <laughs> I've really never heard anyone along the way, male or female, that said, oh, Paul was so cool or such a great guy or Paul did this and it was great. I've, I've only heard bad things about him from everybody. So in 1994, a uh, this this victim, who was a 15-year-old sophomore, was drunk on Elm Street, which is close to where we actually live. 
This article from 2016, she was 39 years old at the time when she recalls the account of what happened to her. She remembers Paul and his friend laughing as they prop her up and cussing and calling her the B word and telling her to be quiet. They said, this B better not throw up on me. She believes she was roofied and raped and discarded by Paul. Two years later in 1996, Paul was named as a suspect in Kristen's case. He was also drunk and propped up to walk by Paul. Perhaps Kristen would be alive if the 94 case was caught and Paul was convicted. Perhaps his alleged serial sexual assaults could have been prevented. Back to the teen story from 1994. They left her on her porch, knocked on the door and ran. Her shocked mom opened the door screaming, oh my God. Hold on guys, I gotta take a break for a minute. I'm getting car sick. I wasn't anticipating the windy road, guys. I'm so sorry. We're just gonna drive for a while. Then we can check out the scenery. Okay, prior to this night, prior to the night that he SA'd her, she would occasionally get rides with Paul and never, there was never any problems with the rides. He was never inappropriate and would say hi at school. He was a fellow, until a, a day when a fellow student warned her. I'll get back to you guys. I'm so sorry guys, I can't, I can't read in the, these conditions, I can't. Classmate said Paul might be stalking her. He said he saw Paul writing her name over a hundred times on a piece of paper and circled her name over and over. She assured Paul maybe he was crushing on her and she wasn't concerned. She decided to hang out with Paul at his friend's house one evening. She drank from a cup given to her and next thing she knew she passed out she came around and paul was on top of her she was on her back he was fully barring her she described in detail and i'm not going to go in depth it's just gross and disgusting she blacked out and then recalls being dragged down the street and left on the doorstep her mom and dad called the police immediately and brought her to the hospital. She explained what Paul had done after getting Paul and the other two boys story from, they went back to the house and got their story basically. And the police said that she was drunk and it was consensual. She and her father were begging for something to be done. She again insisted she never consented. <coughs> Two years later, the teen victim saw Paul regarding 
Kristen on the news. Knowing he was a suspect, she felt lucky and realized that it could have been her. So that's the first story. Now I'm gonna go into a story of a lady named Sarah, and this is from Cal Poly. In 1996, after Kristen disappeared, Paul would show up at parties like a tag along, all the drunken parties. He was often there. Many of the girls referred to Paul as lurking, stalking, creepy, molester, and ew. Many times Paul was beat up by other males at parties for being aggressive, pervy, inappropriate, a weirdo. Here is one such instance involving Sarah. In 1995, before Kristen disappeared, he grabbed her crotch on a dance floor. So she got in his face yelling at him and her friend threw gum in his face. So he pushed her down then all the dudes jumped on Paul and then Paul ran off. In 96, at a friend's birthday, he pushed in through as she entered the bathroom, pinned her and said disgusting sexual things to her, even saying he would are her among other things, spitting as he talked. She kneed him in the balls, kicked him his shin and ran off. Luckily, all the males at the party got involved, even warning Paul to never do this again. He's, the guy said, never look at her. If you go near her, I will kill you. <laughs> Someone else pushed Paul, sending him crashing through a desk. He got up and ran away. She never saw Paul again until the mugshot on the news. But Paul realizing it was him, she's still haunted and afraid. Next story will be a story from Paul's female cousin. I wasn't looking. You didn't pass the town site turn, right? I wasn't looking. Okay, the female cousin. They were camping in Fresno area in the early 90s, and the cousin was messing with him on the way to the store where they were gonna get slush puppies. She was kidding around and swiping at his wallet. He got pissed, threw her to the ground, got on top of her, put his hands down her bathing suit and groped her. Thankfully, a woman demanded he get off her and threatened to call the cops. Okay, I'm gonna have to take a break. This is really windy right here. I'm not feeling good. <laughs> I wanted to take you guys out here for a while though. You see how rugged this is? So my place for sale, maybe. No, we're not. <clears throat> the next story we're gonna fast forward to 2002. By this time, Paul had been kicked out of Cal Poly. He had been rejected by the Navy. He was flipping burgers at Garland's which I have an episode at Garland's as well. He was attending Los Angeles Harbor Community College. And the next story is going to be from a lady named Laura. Right now I got a strobe light effect coming across my notes. <laughs> and this is officially the most challenging shoot I've tried to do yet. Hopefully you guys are appreciating this, the coverage and getting a good look for yourselves the terrain here and where would you even begin I don't know the exact location of where that shoe was found or where that skate ramp was I don't think the skate ramp is connected I'm going to insert pictures of uh, the area where the shoe was found but it looks just like all the rest of the area here oh they trimmed up all these trees all the fresh cuts okay so back to Laura's story Laura met him at a Hermosa Beach bar she was 21 at the time every eventually she moved in with him and there was also a male roommate that lived with them the apartment was in Lawndale Paul worked construction and mommy paid a lot of his bills for housing and schooling and all that, a lot of his costs. 
Laura said he was a crappy boyfriend. He cheated on her. He lied. He would get touchy-feely with her friends. And he, even with her, he was very sexually aggressive. She often had to remind him to calm down during intimate times. One time they were wrestling in bed and he got extremely aggressive and held a butter knife to her face. She begged and screamed for him to stop. And the male roommate marched in and demanded he get off and leave her alone. I'll tell you about the other time in a second. These really, really wanted the parts, I just can't. Another time he slapped her arm in an argument. She dumped him and later discovered his connection to the Kristen case. She was shocked. Haunted and crying, she called her mom. To tell her about what happened. And this is something I wondered about, like the girls that have been with him because he moved down south where the story is not so well known. And these girls had no idea. Stan and Denise Smart have both commented and praised the women for telling the truth about what Paul has done to them. It's unfortunate that a lot of times when these things happen, just nobody listens. And then what happens from there? The perpetrator will just repeat what he's done. Why wouldn't he? There's no recourse. The next section is going to be about Paul at Cal Poly. And what he was at Cal Poly, his major was food, sur food sciences. And he actually got a D in the course. He wasn't very good at school. His freshman GPA was .06. Oh my God. I've never even heard of a GPA that low. A lot of people wonder how he even got into Cal Poly in the first place. Well, Cal Poly had a special program for students in Slow County where they would be able to attend. Yeah, this is the right turn to out to the town site. Okay, hold on. I'm going to stop for a minute. So this is heading into the town site of Wasna Valley. And this eventually dead ends, you'll see. And I want to show you guys the house we almost rented up here. It's going to be this one coming up on the left here. We almost rented this place. It's a pretty trippy house. They have a root cellar in the bottom and stuff, and like the water tower and a nice chunk of land. Nice chunk of land. Yeah. And right over here is going to be the schoolhouse to the right. And we are going to actually cut here for a moment. Um, I'm going to go do a separate episode of this schoolhouse. A lot of you know that I love history, so we're gonna, oh, there's a teepee out there too. So this is the little historic schoolhouse. I'll be back. Okay guys, I moved the camera to a little different POV. And uh, we're leaving the historic schoolhouse now. So there'll be a short little episode about that if you want to know more about the history and the adorable little red historic schoolhouse from 1907. There it is, I see it. It's so cute. All right, we're gonna go to the dead end out here at town site. So continuing on with Cal Poly shenanigans for Paul the Chester, Chester Paul. In December, yeah, Chomo. Well, no, not child. Yeah, it's not children. True. Yeah, it's not children. In December, which was his freshman year at Cal Poly, at 1 a.m., a female Cal Poly student called the police in a panic to report Paul had climbed to her balcony, up to her balcony, and wouldn't leave. When the cops got there, he had already left. 
six weeks later, Paul was racing the streets of San Luis Obispo and was spotted by police. Paul was slurring his words and his eyes were bloodshot red. He went into the gas station when the cop was trying to talk to him when he bought gum, stuffed a bunch of gum in his mouth. And when he came out, the cop ordered him to get rid of the gum and had him perform a breathalyzer, which of course he flunked with a 0.13% blood alcohol. He lost his driver's license. And many say that going all the way back to high school that Paul had a drinking problem going way back. And that drinking problem continued at Cal Poly and even when he moved to Southern California, which is when he, he moved away from this area because he was known for not good things. Here's some more stories about what various people said happened when they were at parties with the drunken Paul. Sorry, we, when we're slower, we pull over for folks. You might notice that. But he was always annoying. He was always hitting on all the girls. We're back. Sorry. I guess the phone got bumped out of recording. We're at the dead end here. So I'm just going to finish what I didn't do. And you'll see that same stretch of road you missed as we exit. Okay, so here we go. I got to get this wrapped up because I'm feeling really, really, really sick. <laughs> and it's, it's, I think this bumpy road was horrible. Oh my goodness. The sun is blasting my face. So we were talking about how he was just obnoxious at the parties and all that, and how even Cheryl Anderson was one of the last people to see Kristen as well, and he even tried to get touchy-feely with her, remember? And she and her friends are the ones who nicknamed him Chester the Molester. And that's her opinion. She's entitled to it. Many of the other females in the dorm also called Paul Chester the Molester referred to him as just a nasty man. So two weeks later before Christmas, Paul was speeding over 100 miles an hour. I'm um, excuse me, over 50 miles an hour, not 100. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to shade the sun for blasting my face and freeze this and hold this. That <laughs> oh, was so sad when I realized that this got cut out. You don't even know. Can you do that? I can't do it with this. We gotta shut, shut the sunroof. Sorry, guys. I cannot see. surrounding him regarding Kristen's disappearance so many years before. Ruben locked eyes on the reporter who sat down and asked for the Flores side of the story regarding missing Kristen Smart. Paul said no and looked down at the table. Ruben then told the reporter he had found a note he left at his house. 
and then he said, I quote, we don't want to talk to you, no thank you. Susan was digging through her purse as her face was getting redder. She pulled out a stack of papers, peeled off a piece and said, print this. And this was uh, five lines. And the first line said, a long time ago we chose to. The second line said, handle our legal matters in a. Third line said, court of law. Fourth line said, not in the. And the fifth line said, media court of public opinion. So she was apparently giving these out like business cards or something to people. Here's the last little tidbit of what I have. And then I can put my eyes on the road. And, uh, hopefully get rid of this motion sickness. But this has been giving you a really good idea of what it's like out here in Wasna, where it's believed she's been scattered. I find this insight interesting as far as the dynamics of the family, including the paranoia, the lack of accountability, how they're all sketchy ass people in my opinion. And I can have an opinion, we're all entitled to one. In contrast, we have the smart family who's trying to get scholarships set up in honor of their daughter or put fun runs together in honor of their daughter. So that's it guys. Sorry this was a really rough one, but I stuck it through. I wanted to get you guys the information and I'm gonna go now. So justice for Kristen, bye. If I can't keep my head held high enough, I'll just be love and watch the smiles come. Thanks for watching. Bring my spirits up. Don't forget to stop and smell the flowers. There's some shit I like to fix, but I still